Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Authors at Google event. Following the talk, we will have a Q&A session, and uh, I'd like to ask you to remember our remote audience and use the microphone, which will be this one, well, when you're asking a question. Today, I'm pre pleased to introduce Dr. Keith Devlin. Keith is a World Economic Forum Fellow and a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He is a co-founder and executive director of HSTAR, the institute at Stanford that focuses on research on people and technology, how we use it and how it affects us. Keith is visiting Google today to talk about his latest book, The Unfinished Game. He has written 28 books and many more research papers and popular articles, so perhaps you know him as an author of The Math Gene or The Numbers Behind Numbers based on the TV show. Or maybe you have heard Keith as the math guy on NPR's Weekend Edition. Um, paleontologists will recognize Keith as the namesake of a 25 million year old extinct ringtail possum, Pildra Devlini. <laughs> Can anyone watch that? <laughs> yeah, that, that one's pretty tough. Um, I, however, know Keith as a, as a cyclist. Uh, and I can even give you a mathematical formula to predict how long it will take him to climb a steep hill. And that is you take my best time up the hill and multiply it by 0.7. So now here is Keith Devlin. Okay. Thank you. So the challenge is I've got to reduce it to 0.6 this year. Okay, that's, that's pretty clever. <laughs> I think that's called setting the bar high as opposed to the vice presidential debate tonight. Okay, um, talking of which, this is a familiar site, right? a house in foreclosure. And I'm sure that people are gonna be making a lot of money writing books, analyzing what went wrong and what led to the debacle. Um, but they'll be overlooking what I think is actually a really interesting question about this. How is it that mortgages exist in the first place? You know, we, we accept the fact that Ordinary people of fairly ordinary means can buy a house. Didn't always used to be like that. In fact, that's a very recent phenomenon. Well, of course, we do it by, buying, by, bo by borrowing money. But wait a minute, why would anyone want to lend money to someone they've never met? And that very often is the case. For a transaction that will take 25, 30 years to complete, if it's gonna be completed, where all sorts of things can happen. There can be wars and storms and fires and earthquakes and so forth. So the very collateral for the loan is at risk. It depends upon the fact that the value perceived by the market is gonna remain at a certain minimal level to make the loan secure. And yet for many years this system worked and people did get used to the fact, and we have all got used to the fact, that we can get mortgages. And moreover, the people that lend the money can do so in a competitive marketplace. They can make a good living, even though there are other people vying for the same customers for those loans. Because the only way you can do that is by having a very, very good and reliable way of predicting what's likely to happen tomorrow, or a week from now, or a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now. In other words, we have to be able to predict the future, not in the sense of what will happen, but putting numerical estimates on what is likely and less likely and more likely to happen so that we can man manipulate our exposure and our risks according to the perceived dangers that are out ahead. So the whole system depends upon being able to predict the future with actually with quite a bit of, of accuracy. If you think about mortgages in that competitive marketplace, mortgages are, are won and lost on, a, on an eighth of a percent. So the actual rate at which you're charged uh, the interest rate varies by eighths of a percent. So it's pretty precise predictions. So the models, we have mathematical models that allow us to predict, or to, to, to really give us the information for setting uh, those interest rates and for deciding who to give loans to and at what rates and so forth. That ability to look into the future is one that we accept. We live in a world where we, we plan ahead. Um, even from something as simple as, as organizing a barbecue, we'll, watch the, you know, we'll go online or we'll watch the news and we'll say that the chance of rain tomorrow is, 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 is 3% or 5%. Okay, it makes sense to organize a barbecue. If the chance of rain is 30%, we may well cancel the barbecue. So, and, and that's just one of many instances where we, we, we make decisions, we perform actions based upon our estimates, and they're reliable estimates, they have to be reliable, of what tomorrow or next week may bring. As I say, that's very recent. Uh, it actually goes back to the 17th century, and it's rather interesting, as I'm gonna show you. What happened in the 17th century is one of these rare watershed moments where up to a certain time, people thought something was impossible, and right after that time, 
everyone accepted it as normal. To the degree that when you look back, you can't imagine life being any different. To the best of my knowledge, that's happened three times in the course of human history because of an advance in mathematics. Three things in mathematics, three advances in mathematics have led to ordinary people, regular human beings, conceiving of their world and their life in a different way. So I'm not talking about how mathematics changes the world. I mean, you know, we're at Google, right? So Google, you know, a la page rank is where a piece of mathematics changes the environment in which people do things. And we're used to the fact that mathematics changes our environment, changes the way we live our lives. But it doesn't really change the way we conceive of life. Some things become easier and faster, but life itself, uh, I mean, the, the, our cognition hasn't changed. What I want to talk about is where something revolutionary happened in mathematics that changed the very way we encounter the world. And in fact, a revolution occurred. So I'm looking at revolutions. I've already mentioned, I think there were three times in the history uh, of humanity where a mathematical advance has led to a revolution in the way people, ordinary people think about the world. Not, not just mathematicians, not just engineers and scientists, but ordinary people living their lives. For example, calculus is not one of those cases. Calculus affected science, technology, business, medicine, everything around us, but ordinary people do not think differently because of calculus. They may think differently because some of the things that depend on calculus, they certainly do. But you can't really say calculus changed the way people think. On the other hand, something else that happened at the same time as calculus was invented in the 17th century did change the way people think about the world. I'm thinking of revolutions inside the mind. Changes the way people think, our expectations, the way we live our lives, the way we direct our lives. There's maybe a fourth one going on now. Who knows? You can't, you can't detect a revolution except with hindsight. But there's so much stuff going on, uh, and, and there seems to be so many changes, and it's even hard to say whether what's driving it. Is it the mathematics behind it? Is it the technology? I mean, what's going on? Stuff is changing. Uh, my guess is we are in some kind of a major change. It's more than a guess. I think we all think that. Um, but whether you can trace this one to a single mathematical advance, I have no idea. Uh, and history will sort of parse that one out. Um, but one that's much easier to identify is just numbers, the invention of numbers. I mean, we can't imagine a world without numbers. We just can't. I mean, you can't do anything. We live our lives by numbers, even the most a uh, math-averse person in the world lives his or her life by numbers. But that's, they're, not that, they're not that old. Numbers were invented, to the best of our knowledge, and we've got quite a lot of good knowledge now based on anthropological evidence. Numbers, uh, we think, were invented in Sumeria, in the Fertile Crescent region of what's now largely Iraq, uh, about 5,000 BC, 7,000 years ago, pretty recent. The, the actual span of this development was something between 10,000 and maybe 3,000 BC. So it's, a, it's something of that age. But 5,000 BC is a pretty good date to put on when we think that numbers really were being used. Prior to that, people were counting. Counting goes back at least 35,000 years, but you don't need numbers to count. You can put marks on a stick or a stone, or you can put piles of pebbles together. You don't need an abstract system of numbers in order to count. Uh, why did they invent numbers? Banking. The Sumerian society reached a stage of sophistication that it was no longer adequate to just trade 10 jars of oil for two oxen or whatever the exchange rate between oxen and jars of oil was at the time. They wanted bankers. They wanted people who kept a track of, of, of an individual person's wealth, their, what they owned, uh, their land and their, their, their goods and so forth, and through whom they could negotiate trades with other people. And it's actually an interesting story. It's, it's, I'm going to give a very brief account of this story because this is a pivotal moment in human development. Uh, the, the research was largely done by Denise schmant Besserus at U University of Texas at Austin. Uh, been there all of her career. And back in 1971, when she was a young postdoc, or a young PhD student and a postdoc, uh, she went out to the, the Fertile Crescent region uh, just on an anthropological dis discovery expedition. She wasn't thinking about mathematics or anything like that. She was just looking for artifacts and trying to put together a story, an understanding of that, that early society. And she kept coming across piles of these tokens, some of which looked very abstract, some of which looked as though they were remarkably like maybe a goose, uh, 
uh, or a jar of oil or something. Um, and after seeing the, the, the context in which they were found and trying to understand the society, she came to the conclusion that these were the precursors of numbers. Instead of just having marks on sticks, the Sumerians had a sophisticated system of little tokens that represented something that you had. So if you had five jars of oil, you might have five of these. And you would take those along to the banker and the banker would keep those tokens as a record of how many jars of oil you owned. So you could measure your wealth by counting the individual tokens. Interesting to note that different tokens were used to represent different kinds of objects. And they were indeed physical tokens. Um, what happened next was that the bankers needed a way of keeping these tokens separate so your tokens and my tokens don't get mixed up and so that I can be sure that no one's tampered with them. So you wanted some way of securely enclosing an individual's tokens. So they would take a sheet of clay, wet clay, flatten it out into a sheet, put all the person's tokens in the sheet, wrap the thing together, seal it up. I guess you'd put some kind of a marker on it to show that it was sealed in your presence. And then it would stay there. When you wanted to trade something, you would go to the bankers, the two people would go, the, the banker would break open the case, open the tokens and start moving the tokens around, see if you've got enough tokens to buy something or whatever. Of course, that's okay, and it's a really good if you're a banker because you're spending a lot of time making these cases. Um, we haven't got numbers yet. We still haven't got numbers yet. We're getting towards numbers. Uh, one disadvantage, of course, is if you simply want to check your account, you know, the bank is fine because they're going to charge you a commission for breaking that thing. So checking your account is not easy. This is a piggy bank. So they had a smart idea. They said, well, before we seal the thing up, we will impress on the outside all of the objects that are going to go inside. So then, when you seal it up, you don't need to break it to find out what's inside because you've got a record on the outside. And that was fine, and they did that for a while. And then along comes a really smart banker and says, wait a minute. Actually, probably the banker wouldn't say this because the banker's about to lose his or her business. Someone came along and said, if you've got marks on the outside, why do you need the tokens on the inside? Why don't we do this? This sounds like getting rid of the gold standard, right? You don't need the tokens on the inside. You can just read the things on the outside. So you don't need to have it sealed up. You might just as well have a clay tablet with marks on it. So all you would need is one token of each type, depending on different kinds of objects, and the banker could have those tokens, and then just impress them on a tablet. So your wealth was measured by marks on a tablet. The contents had disappeared. Well, think about it for a minute. You've got objects in the world. You've got tokens representing the objects. And you've got marks on a card, on a piece of card, well, not on a card, actually, marks on a piece of clay representing the tokens. You've thrown away the middle things, the tokens. The ghosts of those recently departed quantities, which I think is a phrase I can probably use in this audience from Newton, so the, actually from Bishop Berkeley, the ghosts of the recent departed objects are what we now call numbers. Numbers are the abstractions that are left when you throw away the tokens in the middle because you have the symbols on the page representing the numbers, representing the things in the world. So numbers were what left when they threw away the tokens. And of course, when they did that, and, and at the same time, recognize that you actually just need one kind of a, an object. You don't need to have separate tokens for different kinds of objects. So we've got the very first credit card. <laughs> uh, I might have played with the scale to make it different size, but it's essentially the same idea. Um, Okay, I remember I was living in Germany when credit cards became very common, except in Germany. Because the Germans didn't like credit cards because they weren't real money. They wanted money. You had to carry money around in Germany in those days. Um, interesting times. Okay, okay uh, so numbers came on the scene about 5000 BC and changed everything because we have numbers and, uh, and once we had them, people started to make use of them uh, and uh, our lives are built around them and it's no longer possible to imagine living a life without numbers. They're just part of the fabric of our lives. On the other hand, people use numbers to measure things, to count things, keep track of things. Uh, most people didn't use numbers to do any calculations. You paid somebody else to do those for you. You paid someone who was trained to use various kinds of devices uh, which did the calculations for you. So there wasn't a particularly efficient way of dealing with these abstractions. Okay. 
the stage is now set for the second of these big revolutions, which is taking numbers from these tokens, these abstractions that are out there that people can manipulate for us, and bringing them into our minds so that we can work with them inside our minds. Now, the method for doing that, the method for doing arithmetic, mental arithmetic, or written arithmetic, uh, traces back to the Indian mathematicians in the first, in the years 0 AD to seventh, end of the 7th century, thereabouts, uh, who developed what we now call the, the, the Hindu-Arabic number system, the, the, the standard decimal place value system of arithmetic. That was developed in the first seven centuries AD in India, uh, brought northwest through to North Africa by the, the, the traders in the Arab world. And then this young Italian guy, who was a son of a, of a, commerce, of a commercial person in Pisa, Pisa at that time being the center of world, at least of European commerce, uh, a lot of trading going on in the Mediterranean. Uh, young Leonardo of Pisa, his father was a tradesperson and then a customs official. And the father was posted to North Africa into what's now known as Bougia. Well, it's one of its names. I guess that's the French name. Uh, went over to join his father. Uh, was an interesting, was a kid that was sort of interested in mathematics and various other things. He was a smart kid. In North Africa, he saw the, some scholars doing these calculations on, on paper or whatever they use, sort of vellum or something. They were scribbling calculations using this interesting looking system. And he had, because of his background, what I sometimes have referred to as a, a sort of a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates moment, moment. He sort of looked at this and said, wow, these scholars are doing something that if we can take that stuff that they know and give that to every tradesperson, that tradesperson can change their lives because they can do this for themselves. So in some ways, this was the first personal computer revolution. And that was his genius. He, he was a pretty good mathematician, but his real genius, to my mind, is he saw this system that was a, an object of scholarly interest and said, this is bigger than just a bunch of mathematicians. This is something that ordinary people can use in their everyday life, uh, in particular if they're in the in business of trading and so forth. So he wrote a book, an enormous book called Liber Abaci, first published in 1202, which described this method, what we now regard as the standard way, the standard algorithms for doing addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It's a huge book. I mean, it's, it's, it's several hundred pages in the English translation, as the English translation by Springer for lag. Um, interesting part about this, this is an image that I had taken for me in Siena. One of, there are four manuscripts in existence that go back almost to Leonardo's time. One of them actually could well have been transcribed while Leonardo was still alive. And it was this one. And it's in the Siena Public Library. It's a regular book in a public library. It's owned by the citizens of Pisa. And you can go into the library, and I couldn't believe this happened, but it really did. You go into the library, and you get this, and you say, I want to see this manuscript. Now, a little bit of thing. They will take your passport at that time. <laughs> they take your passport, but then they'll take you into their back room, and a guy will go to the shelf and bring it and put it on the table and say, how long do you want? You know, an hour, two hours, there you go. Walk away and leave. Now, there's someone watching you. I mean, they're not stupid. I mean, this is, there's only four of these things in existence, but it's a public book, and you're allowed to read it, and you can just go in and, well, you've got to read Latin, um, uh, and I can sort of read Latin, because I grew up in England, and in, in, when you grew up in England, you had to learn Latin to go to university. Um, but that was a long time ago, and I've forgotten most of it. Um, but who wants to read it? You can read the English translation. Um, it was really cool to just hold this thing and thought, Leonardo might have actually seen this particular manuscript. Uh, absolutely mind-blowing. And you can just read the whole thing. It's, just, it's still there. OK, the English translation is certainly easier to read, but it doesn't make it a bestseller. I will not recommend this as a good... It's hundreds and hundreds of word problems about trading cotton and exchanging money and people in a small business dividing the, the profits and so forth. It's a how-to manual for doing arithmetic. Um, it's actually rather more than that because he also investigates some mathematical ideas. But what he was really doing with this book was, you know, it was the Steve Jobs, Bill Gates sort of thing. It was make it widely accessible to everybody. And that's what he did. Um, it took a while to sort of take effect. I mean, it took a while for this thing to spread out. 
First of all, it was handwritten manuscripts, so it wasn't just like instantly publishing something in paper, let alone on the web. So it took some generations to spread around, but as copies were made, more and more people learned how to do it, and eventually it became the system that we now accept. Okay, so that was the beginning of a revolution, because ordinary people could start doing things in their mind and keeping track of their world using elementary ideas of arithmetic. And that revolution it sort of went on for several hundred years until Galileo really sort of nailed the end of it by saying, if you want to, so, so the, the, the Leonardo part changed commerce and everyday life. Leonardo comes along and essentially invents modern science and on its heels technology and medicine and so forth because he says, hey, if you want to understand the world, the best thing to do is hang numbers on it, assign numbers to various things in the world and look at numerical patterns between them. So you invent things called force and temperature and acceleration and velocity and so forth. You, in, you have all of these abstract notions that you hang on the world to look at various phenomena in the world and you can put numbers on them and then you can talk about the world with numerical precision. So then we get modern science. <laughs> and that I would say is the end of, because I'm, you know, one could say this was a separate revolution from Leonardo. I've tended to bundle it together. It was taking place in Pisa. It was over a three or 400 year period. But to my mind, it was really part of the same progression. Using numbers, using arithmetic for commerce and, uh, and in science and technology. So it was, uh, the, the, the revolution was really using numbers to understand the world we live in. The third revolution was using numbers not to understand the world we live in, but to understand the future. So the question is, how do we predict the future? Not using a crystal ball, but using... Mathematics, okay. Um, and actually not necessarily using that kind of a device, um, but using something more abstract. And this is an even more interesting, uh, this is the, the focus of the book and it's the focus of the rest of the talk, because this is one of those rare moments when we can look back in history and say not only that something happened within a 3,000 year span, or not only that something happened within a two or 300 year span, but that something happened on a Monday. Not any old Monday, but Monday, August the 24th, 1654. Because that was the day when Pascal, a pretty famous French mathematician, sent a letter to another famous French mathematician, Pierre de Fermat, uh, who by my books is one of the best five mathematicians of all, uh, best 10 mathematicians of all time. Um, it's easier to defend than being in the top 10. It gets tricky if he's in the top five. Um, okay, sent a letter. This was actually a letter in part of a correspondence. A few months earlier, uh, Pascal had opened up a conversation. They'd never met, by the way, but the, uh, Pascal, in the connection with the problem that I'm going to be talking about, sent a letter to Fermat asking his advice. And the two of them exchanged letters. The original letter's been lost. Several others uh, must have existed that have been lost, but seven of them still exist. Uh, in the original French, uh, and, uh, and you can read in English translations. In fact, they're all available on PDF files, so they're easy to get at. <laughs> During the course of the correspondence, they worked on this problem of the unfinished game, or the problem of the points that I'll talk about. And about a third of the way, or halfway through the correspondence, Pascal writes this fairly long letter, it's about 3,000 words, in which he summarizes an argument that Fermat has given, explains an argument he's been working on, and tries to sort of analyze these arguments for solving this particular problem. It's a problem about calculating the odds or calculating the winnings in a game of dice. Okay. In that letter is the, the key idea behind modern probability theory. The fact that we, our acceptance of the fact that we can predict the future numerically using probability theory that's the letter where it appears. Now there were some beginnings of, you can trace beginnings of this earlier on. There was a, another Italian called Girolamo Cardano that had looked at issues of gambling. But until then, when people had been looking at calculating probabilities, they'd essentially been calculating the probabilities of certain rolls of the dice coming out. What's the chances of getting a seven if you roll two dice? What's the chances of getting an eight if you roll two dice? It was that kind of calculation. It wasn't, what will the future bring? The problem they were looking at was not what will happen when you roll dice repeatedly, it's what would happen when the future unfolds. And it turns out that, which to us, that's not a big distinction. To these guys, it was huge. 
Okay, the letter, by the way, in the book, the whole letter is revealed uh, chapter by chapter and then all of it's repeated at the end. It's an interesting letter. Um, for one thing, it's written in the most polite language imaginable. Now, I, I've spent my whole career uh, in universities and academics today are not unbelievably polite. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, a, it's a consequence of the tenure system. If everyone's got tenure, you're basically locked in the world together and people can be as mean to each other as they like. And of course they are. Um, but these guys, this was even before then, these guys were just living on the, the, the wealth of the family or patronage of the local nobleman or whatever. The letter is beautifully written in wonderful flowing language. I'm sure it's even more beautiful in French, but my French is extremely poor. Um, but it's, uh, uh, it's worth noting the kind of things they're saying. This is the beginning of the, of the letter. As I say, it's 3,000 words. If you look at it, Pascal, this great mathematician, he's basically saying, I'm not sure which way we should be going. Uh, I want to lay my whole reasoning before you, uh, set me straight. He's been working on this for several weeks. He's not sure he's got it right. In fact, it turns out he hasn't got it right. What was so difficult about the problem we were solving? Well, it turns out that today, it's not a difficult problem at all. In fact, it's such a simple problem, a simple solution, that we can give that solution to high school students. People do in their classes. We can even put it on broadcast television. A few years ago, I worked with PBS on a series called Life by the Numbers, and we had no qualms whatsoever about it. That's not quite true. I didn't have any qualms. The producer was a bit ner nervous, but we I persuaded him about showing the entire proof on television for an audience. And I'll show you the proof, because this is a nice way of, of, of showing you the problem and showing you the proof. But the thing to bear in mind is, you're going to find this, many of you I'm sure already know it, but you're going to find this solution straightforward and obvious. You've got to bear in mind that two of the best mathematicians in history struggled for many weeks to get this. You're about to see Fermat's solution. The problem that piqued Pascal and Fermat's interest revolved around a game of dice that comes to an untimely end. Suppose two people are playing a game. They're gambling with each other. And halfway through the game, they have to abandon it. One person is ahead of the other person at that stage. Question, how do they divide the pot so that it's fair to both? Now, if you think about it, that means you have to look into the future the potential future that would have happened had they been able to complete the game. I was a lot younger then. <laughs> In a series of letters, Pascal and Fermat imagined a game of dice to be played in five rounds. The first person to win three rounds wins the game. In their scenario, they imagined that Fermat was ahead two rounds to one. Fermat just needs one more round to win. Next, the mathematicians looked at all the possible outcomes. For example, if Fermat won rounds four and five, he would win the game because he would have won at least three of five rounds. If Fermat won round four and lost round five, then he'd win again, because again, he won three of five rounds. If Fermat lost round four and won round five, he'd still win. In fact, the only way for Fermat to lose would be if he lost both of the last two rounds. Given these possible outcomes, Fermat and Pascal correctly reasoned the odds were three to one in favor of Fermat. Therefore, Fermat should get three quarters of the pot and Pascal one quarter. The mathematicians calculated how a slight edge would result in one player winning more often than not. <laughs> 
before that letter was written, before that solution was found, not only did people not know how to do that kind of a calculation, the common wisdom, the almost universal wisdom, was it was impossible. The belief was mathematics is stuff you use to study the world we live in, not to study the future. In fact, going back to Aristotle, the future was in the hand of the gods. Mathematics was simply not applicable to the future. So one, you know, when you realize that two great mathematicians struggled, well, Fermat, we don't know how long Fermat struggled before he came out with that solution. He may have come up with it fairly quickly. But for sure, Pascal was struggling throughout the correspondence. In fact, when you read the rest of the correspondence, it's not totally clear that by the time he died, he died fairly young, Pascal was only 39 when he died of stomach cancer, it's not clear that he ever really understood that solution. And for sure, in the letter that's the focus of the book, he's arguing against it, and he's been showing Fermat's solution to other people, and they're arguing against it as well. They don't believe that. And you have to ask yourself, why is it that they had so much trouble with that kind of an argument? And it's to do with the fact that it was in the future. Okay, it was all about, and this is that original first paragraph. Um, you know, look again at the fact that it's, uh, he's, he's having trouble to understand it. He really doesn't. As he goes in the, through the letter, he starts looking at generalizations of the problem to, show that, to try and show that Fermat's argument is wrong. So he has a lot of trouble with it. And yet, within a very short space of time, like two or three years of the letter being written, it was widely accepted. So you go, from a period when people think something's not only difficult but in fact impossible to have been widely accepted. And let's just look briefly at the history. It's called the problem of the points or the unfinished game, among other names. We don't know when the problem began, but it was first written, at least the first ev written evidence we've got of the thing is in a book by Luca Pacioli, published in 1494. It certainly predates that. The problem of splitting the pot of an unfinished game. And it can be any game. I mean, they just pick the best of five for throwing dice. But any game that's split partly way through, how do you divide the pot fairly based on how far ahead one person is? Uh, Pacioli tried to solve it, didn't get anywhere. Uh, and these are all pretty well-respected mathematicians of the time. Cardano, whom I've mentioned, he was the guy who first said that uh, if, you're, if you're throwing, you multiply the odds when they're independent events in modern terminology. The, the, some of the stuff of the basic calculus of probability theory goes back to Cardano, all in the co context of, of throwing dice in a, in a casino. Um, he tried and failed. So a very smart guy, failed to do it. Another famous uh, mathematician, uh, known for his work in algebra, amongst other things, and for a feud about that in 1556. He tried to solve it, was unable to, and actually said, you know, this is not a solvable problem. There is no solution. You cannot decide mathematically how to fairly assign the pot from an unfinished game because it's about the future and mathematics can't be applied to the future. So that's the issue. When can you apply mathematics to the future? When you read this, you read, I'll, I'll tell you, by the way, I, I forget when I took my first course in probability. I, was, I guess I was an undergraduate and I took a course in probability. And my memory is that the professor came in and on the first day told the story about the fact that there was this letter from Pascal to Fermat in which this probability theory was essentially established. Uh, I think it was then, but in any case, it was part of my worldview coming out of, of my mathematics education, that probability theory goes back to this letter. Um, and if you've had, many of you, I'm sure, have had lectures in probability theory, the professor has probably said that. I've since given several lecture courses on probability theory, and I usually begin with this story about the fact that there was a letter. Had I read the letter? <laughs> no, no, I can't read it. I just repeated the story. Um, and then I... What happened was a publisher from Basic Books came along a few years ago, a good friend of mine who'd published The Math Gene, and said, Basic Books is bringing out this new series of books. I think it's called Basic Ideas. Very clever title, I guess. Uh, and it's about documents that change the course of history. So we're going to look at the Magna Carta, and we're going to look at the, the, the Declaration of Independence, and maybe the Bill of Rights, and so forth. So we're going to be looking at various documents that change the course of history. And we'd like to have at least one in mathematics do you know of a document that changed the course of history? And I said, oh, yeah, there was this letter that Pascal wrote to Fermat that gave us probability theory. I said, it might be worth looking at. So he says, well, see if you can find out more about it. And eventually I found time and dug out the references and started looking at the correspondence. And it blew me away. Because when I started looking at what other people had written before and after, and when I started reading that correspondence, it really came home to me that this was a watershed moment. The world went from thinking you could not apply mathematics to the future to doing it left, right, and center. 
And boy, did things change quickly after word got out that you could apply mathematics to the future. Because it's not difficult mathematics, it's just counting. I mean, probability theory, the actual mathematics is trivial. Understanding how to do the counting is tricky, and there are some very notorious probability problems around that cause people a lot of confusions, uh, and actually upon which several lives currently are hanging. There are lives, human lives currently hanging on which way a certain probability problem is calculated, and right now there is no consensus on how to calculate the probabilities. Maybe we'll come back to that at the end. So it, we, we're not out of the woods yet. What happened in the 17th century is repeating itself right now. People in probability theory are arguing about how to do certain kind of calculations. Another mathematician who came up with a sort of solution, it, it didn't really work, it certainly doesn't work, and then he ended up saying, no, no, you, you just can't do this. Uh, then along comes this, this um, he's not a mathematician, he's a sort of a nobleman, a minor nobleman, the Chevalier de Mere, um, a gambler is what he was more than anything else, but he was a gambler who believed that you could count things and use mathematics to improve your chances of winning, or more precisely, to reduce the amount by which you're likely to lose. I mean, he seemed to be smart enough to realize that the odds are stacked against the individual gambler. Um, he asked his friend Pascal about it, and that's how Pascal began to work on it, and then Pascal was unable to solve it, or at least he found a solution he wasn't sure of. And then at the, at the, at the urging of a friend of Pascal's, Pascal wrote to Fermat, uh, whom everyone had acknowledged was the most powerful mathematician around. So that's how it got to, to Fermat. Here's what happened after that letter. The letter is sent on August the 24th, 1654. Within three years, Christian Huygens had written a book that's essentially a modern book on probability theory. The details were all worked out just three years later, including the notion of expectation, you know, what, you're, what the, the, the aggregate outcome of a, any kind of randomizing situation would be. Um, within a short period of time, independently, not as a result of that, but it just by one of these flukes of history, John Grant, the son of a, an English haberdasher, an English haberdasher, okay, um, well, that's a difficult word to say had published a pamphlet analyzing the mortality tables in London. This was really the, the beginnings of, of actuarial science and statistics, because when you combine probability theory with co collection and tabulation of data, you can make inferences. And he was really the first person who made what we would now call statistical inferences. He manipulated data to sort of correct for uh, errors in its calculation and tabulation. Uh, Huygens then comes back takes those mortality tables, studies of deaths in England through, through the bubonic plague, essentially, and, uh, and develops mortality tables on which you can base an insurance industry. And believe me, people very quickly started to realize that you could sell insurance based on these things and make a good living because you had a good way of predicting when someone's likely to die. How long a male age 30 is likely to live, how long a male age 40 living in a certain part of the country is living. All of that suddenly became available and people started to using it very, very fast. Uh, the young prime minister of the Netherlands, or he became prime minister uh, and shortly afterwards was assassinated. And uh, in 1671, he produced a 16 page pamphlet uh, which had a very, very accurate analysis of annuities pricing because he wanted to sell annuities to raise money to fight a war which he did and then he got killed. Um, which, you know, is a, a salutary warning, I guess. Um, okay. Uh, Halley of Halley's Comet took the issue further by getting more accurate uh, mortality data from Breslau and doing the same kind of calculations, although interesting enough, doing it with more accurate information from another part, another population, turned out to just confirm the, the, the inferences that Grant had made. Um, Okay, we're still, uh, uh, we're still, what, just over 50 years later, the Bernoulli family, of which there were several great mathematicians, came into the picture, uh, and at the same time as they were developing calculus, because calculus was coming on the scene at exactly the same time. Very interesting that at this moment in history, you've got two major revolutions. Calculus, which is gonna give you all of modern science and technology and a lot of medicine, and you've got probability theory, which is gonna give you all of modern commerce, future prediction, risk management, and neither of the, there was no reason why those had to have happened at the same time. 
you've got the commercial world and the, the, the world of risk management and, and the social world, essentially, and you've got the scientific world and the big revolutions that led to them. The mathematical developments took place in the same generation and off they went. Must have been an incredible time to live, I guess. Um, well, it would if you knew what was going on. Okay. Um, he started to apply it to legal and court matters. That gets the probability theory into the courts where it's remained ever since. Uh, and as I say, it's, it's, it's causing all kinds of problems for the appeal courts around the land at the moment. Um, pricing of annuities and so forth. Um, one of his relatives, and I forget who's whose uncle and whose brother because there were a lot of them, um, first used the words probability theory uh, in a book about the art of conjecture. About This is really describing probability theory as a method for predicting the future. Uh, <coughs> Uh, he was the guy that proved the law of large numbers, which you know, is a uh, very technical result, but it sort of means that if you pick a big enough sample, uh, it's representative. Uh, okay. These slides are written for many audiences. This is almost certainly the most erudite mathematical audience I'm likely to give it to. Um, well, I'm speaking up at Redmond next week, so we don't know. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you guys, this is by far the most erudite audience. You were right the first <laughs> And then next week I'll throw up to Redmond and I'll say, nah. because that's fine, except it all goes up on YouTube, doesn't it? So, uh, you can't do anything now, it's not going to be published, but there you go. Um, and then 1733, De Moivre introduces the bell curve, and we've got the ability to apply probability theory, this mathematical theory, to pretty well anything in the world when we collect data. And the only thing that was missing from modern probability theory as it's typically practiced is Bayes' theorem, which comes a little bit later. Uh, and, and is essentially an independent uh, event that, that came after that. Um, but look, I mean, this is a very short space. I mean, most of that stuff happened within the first five or 10 years. And along with that were all the applications, the insurance industry, actuarial science, statistics, uh, well-priced annuities, it was a rush. This was really a revolution, and it changed so fast because what's happened is it was simply a change in worldview. Something that was thought to be impossible was shown to be possible. The mathematics was not particularly difficult. Ordinary people could, well, relatively ordinary people could quickly do it, and people did start doing it. That was a real revolution. And it's just as it's impossible now to think about world without numbers or a world without arithmetic, we can't think of a world where we can't manage the future. We do it all the time. We think about things, we weigh up the future, and we just take it for granted we can do it. But until that letter was written, it was thought to be impossible. Here's how the letter ends, with a little bit missed out. These, monsieur, are my reflections on this topic on which I have no advantage over you except that of having meditated on it longer. But this is of little advantage to me from your point of view since your first class. It's interesting that by then, by the time that this letter had come, Pascal accepts that Fermat has got to be right. When you read the letter, it's clear he doesn't really grasp it. it. He sort of, on one level, he accepts it, but he can't believe it. He, he can't wrap his mind around the fact that it's really working. Um, and he still has his own argument that he's, 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 he wants to pursue. Then he ends up, completes the letter, I beg, to in, I beg you to inform me how you would proceed in your research on this problem. I shall receive your reply with respect and joy, even if your opinion should be contrary to mine. So he's still accepting the fact that they have different views on this. Uh, and when two really smart people, or let's just look at Pascal, when a person who's that smart has trouble understanding something that we regard as simple, that's a revolution. Because the only way it became simple to us was because we completely reorientated and something became, went from being impossible to being simple. You know, it's not like solving Fermat's last theorem. You know, and when Andrew Wiles solved it, we went, its status went from unsolved to solved. There may not be a single person in the room who has read and understood that proof. I certainly haven't. Um, but what I did was I got a published copy of the proof and asked Andrew to sign a copy. So I have a signed copy. So I can show you a proof of Fermat's last theorem, but I wouldn't claim to understand it except in very, very general terms. Um, whereas this, once, once it was done, no problem understanding it. Okay, that's the end of the talk, and I guess we're now into the, uh, the Q&A. Right. when I can find my water. Okay, and I guess you're supposed to go to that mic uh, to ask questions. Hi, uh, thank you, this is fascinating. Um, 
my probability teachers didn't teach me this, so. Ah, yeah. But uh, they didn't teach me it, they just told me the story. Yeah. Right, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I didn't know the details. Mm -hmm. yeah. My question is, yeah. as you point out in the book, and, and as is obvious, gambling and games of chance go back like 5,000 years. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I can't imagine that, you know, two people sat and rolled dice and there weren't people watching, people making side bets, people accumulating experience over, yeah. Yeah. As, as, as well as experience about the weather and everything else. Um, how did they know how to bet? How did they talk about the experience that they had accumulated before they had this framework? Yeah, well, let me answer in two parts because uh, for many years after, or for some years after this result was done, when you, if you look at the early writings on sort of actuarial science, mortality tables, and so forth, the only language people had, you know, once they realized that you could use this method for predicting the future, or for talking about the future, the only language they had for talking about it was in a, a language of gambling. So in the early works, the early writings on insu essentially insurance, on life insurance, if you went to someone who was going to insure your life, that insurer would approach it literally as a gambling problem. It says something like, well, you have 100 units um, and there are 17 units of which you're likely to win, meaning you live at a certain time. And then this, So that person would literally, really literally, in, in its proper sense, regard your life as a gamble and would try to assign numbers so they could use this method. So for some years, the only language that was available, even the word probability wasn't used, they talked about, in, in fact, in the letter, they talk about chances and hazards. Um, the only language that was available for applying this method in the everyday world was the language of the gaming rooms. So it was totally seeped in gambling. Now, as far as we know, the first person that was, that did any study of the patterns, the repetitive patterns of, well, go back even earlier, the early gamblers, they didn't have well-made dice. They had sort of ankle bones of animals and so forth. So until you've got instruments, of ran until you've got randomizers, be they dice or coins, or until you've got them sufficiently well-made that there are regular patterns to be observed, you may not observe patterns. But once they had dice that were sufficiently well-made and sufficiently sort of symmetrical that you would get recognizable patterns, people did start looking at them and thinking about them, and both in practice and, and, and theoretically. About the, some at the end of the 10th century AD, uh, an English bishop did start to look at patterns and sort of say, well, how many ways, how many outcomes are there when you roll two dice? And how many outcomes are there when you roll three dice? And does it make a difference if you roll them together and successively? So from about a, the year 900 and something onwards, late, late 10th century, there was an attempt to look at these the sort of numerical patterns of, of, of these situations. Uh, various other people came along, including Cardano, who's uh, this interesting guy that's a, he's an interesting character in the story and he, pretty, he almost dominates the whole story because he's a much more colorful character than, than either Fermat or Pascal. But Cardano comes along and does quite a lot of work on calculating probabilities. Chevalier de Meret, the guy who, the gambler who took the problem to Pascal, he actually did calculate the odds of various things. Some he got right, some he got wrong. So people did recognize before then, back, to the, back in the 14th, 15th centuries, they recognized that you could calculate odds about individual rolls of the dice. Now to us, calculating the odds about the roll of the dice is a prediction of the future. Because to us, all that happened in that fair mass solution was you look at all of the possible futures, the possible ways the game could come out. We would now draw a tree of possibilities. And you count the ones that are a win for one person, you count them. So it's just probability theory in the same way. But when you look at the letters, it's clear that to those guys, in the one case, the role of the dice was about the world we live in. It's about what's happening, even though it's, it's what happens on the next throw. What they were really saying is, in all the throws that you can imagine making, da, 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 but it was about essentially the here and now. The problem, and I, I'm, I'm, this is my explanation because I had to come up with an explanation for why these guys found this so difficult. The only distinction I can make from the perspective of someone in the 21st century is that in the one case, it was repetitive patterns that you would have observed if you'd been playing dice. And they did know that the best strategy for tomorrow is to do what you do today. You know, the best strategy is to assume that tomorrow is much like today, because most of the time that will do well. 
almost page rank, isn't it? <laughs> you just pick the best strategy for most of the time. So you, that, that, that's probably the way to do it. On the other hand, the problem of the unfinished game was how would the players, have, how would the game have played out? To us, that's essentially the same. But that's from our perspective. To those guys, it very definitely wasn't the same. Um, I, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but I've sort of talked around it. Um, and in fact, that's probably the best I can do is sort of talk around the issue. Because they're interesting. Doing the research on this, I found fascinating trying to understand and put myself back in their place and see what it must have been like. Uh, and of course, you can never do that. We know what we know and we can't forget what we know, but those guys didn't know it. And the certain things that we find obvious, they didn't. Um, I, I actually have two questions, yeah. a brief one and a slightly longer one. My brief question is, I noticed that the two names on your list, you had both Christian Huygens and uh, Edmund Halley, mm -hmm. both of whom were better known as astronomers than mathematicians. Mm -hmm. Was there some unusual connection between, was there something about astronomy back then that made it uh, a, a field for probability theorists, or, um, or? That I doubt. I mean, it was certainly, a, it was one of the driving forces of early arithmetic and yeah. geometry and so forth. So uh -huh. a lot of the early mathematics came out of that. Uh, I mean, Newton's work on calculus was, mm -hmm. was all couched in terms of planetary motion. Um, uh, I think the only answer is that, you know, back then, if you were a math type, you were interested in a bundle of things. Astronomy being one of them, calculating odds being another one, because any, you, you were people that like to count things, I would okay. guess, but yeah. And I, my second question is, um, the other th big news today is um, calculating the future, also known as risk and yeah. evaluating risk. Yeah. Uh, just wondering if you have any comments on the failure or the yeah. lack of failure of people predicting the future that's going on in the news right now? Well, I mean, I think if, if, if the bankers had actually read that letter and, <laughs> and said, what is this telling us? It's telling us that if we've got mathematics and it's demonstrably works, it makes sense to follow the mathematics. And, you know, they got into the trouble we got into because they ignored the models. I mean, and lots of people remarked on the fact that they were doing things that the models were not, not going to survive. And we've got very sophisticated prediction models on what's going to happen in risk management. But all of those models depend upon the fact that at the bottom of the stack, there is something that has value. Well, once they started injecting into the stack things that were essentially valueless, on the blind assumption that property values would keep improving and it wouldn't matter because the price would have gone up, those models were no longer viable. And so, uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the financial risk management peep experts will write long books about it, but the simple answer surely is they simply ignored what the mathematics told them. We can manage risk, but you ignore it at your peril. And I think the game, and of course those guys knew that, but the game was, it'll be somebody else's problem before the what's its name hits the fan. <laughs> and unfortunately it was somebody else's problem, it was the poor property owners at the end. But, yeah. Um, I, I guess I have a little bit of a challenge to the idea that um, nobody believed that mathematics could be applied to the future because mm -hmm. 50 years before you had Brahe and Kepler, um, you know, charting the orbits of the planets and, yeah. and they were using that to predict, you know, when there'd the be an would... eclipse and stuff like yeah. that. So it seemed like the idea that, you know, mathematics did apply to the future was circulating in some sense. In some and, sense, yeah. And I'm wondering right. if it's more like, you know, sort of the collapse of probabilities, you know, this outcome could be in the future, this outcome could be in the future into, you know, okay, that's how you do the payoff. Is, yeah, is yeah, I mean, yeah, we, the trouble is from our perspective, we're trying to parse apart what was the problem that they had. Because even with the, you know, they knew this method, they'd, they knew that if you, if you roll two dice, the chances of something is going to happen is this. You know, they knew the chances of a double six is one in 36, which in a sense is predicting the future. Um, the only read I've got in it is in all of those cases, you're in essentially highly symmetrical, repetitive, essentially mechanical areas where you really have great faith in the fact that what's been happening regularly and repeatedly until now is what will happen next. The planets have been doing this. We've, we've tabulated their orbits based on what they do. We have this belief, this faith, that they will continue to operate in the same way. So in that sense, the only aspect of getting in the future is that what's happening today and in the past is going to repeat. So I think they're all prefaced on the fact that what has been is what will be. Whereas the unfinished game is different. It's a game that literally has not been played out. And we don't, and in fact, if you read the problems they have, a lot of it depended upon, 
what is the space of future possibilities? Because that was the best of three games. And here's one of the arguments that caused a lot of people problems and still does today. In reality, when two people are playing, if it's the best out of five games, when one person has won three games, you stop playing. Mm. But that's not how to calculate the probabilities. You have to look at all the complete tree. And Pascal in particular, and many other people, really balked at that one. Now, nowadays, we would say, OK, you're welcome to consider the case where the game only goes through three rounds, but you have to calculate the probability of that and multiply the probabilities together. So we, uh, we now can understand with hindsight what the issue is, and we realise it's not a big issue and you can deal with it in a couple of different ways. But to them, it was still in the realms of the unknowable future. At least that's the only interpretation I've put on it. Um, and I couldn't come up with another one, which is why I was happy to publish it as a book. Uh, but but in, in, in a sense, the future of possibilities may allow for the fact that someone can write another book with a different interpretation of why it was difficult. I think that's highly unlikely based on my modelling, but <laughs> who knows? Uh, it's in the future, it's in the hands of the publishers or whatever. Thanks yeah. for the talk yeah. and especially the main, main topic. Uh, I have a question about the three revolutions you mentioned. Uh, I could agree with the first and the last, the numbers and the probability. But I don't know what uh, Fibonacci to Galileo was doing to create a revolution in the second point. If it is just uh, documenting whatever mathematical achievements before that have been, it, it has been uh, done like in Arab worlds, India, China, oh, and yeah, all the places yeah. those times. But you place that on top of like uh, a placement, uh, place value system or calculus or mm -hmm even cryptography, those kind of things. But I would like to know what criteria you used to, to, to select three items that, that caused the revolution. Okay, so I was looking for things that affected the way ordinary people around the world view the world. And because of the way the demographics work, the dominant scientific framework is the one that came out through, through, through in that long train up and out through Europe. And Europe had the match. That was the one that became dominant in the science and technology and that got itself into people's mind. The one that got itself into the commercial world that eventually took over was, uh, was the one through, through Leonardo. So the perspective that leads to that selection is what things in history, and it was a selection. I mean, you're quite, I mean you know, you, other people may disagree with that one. The, the, it was a selection of what things happened that changed the way people in the world, and I'm essentially talking about the developed world where you have numbers and science and commerce and so forth, what changed the perceptions, what led to that accepting that fundamental view of the world that's based upon numbers and science and technology and so forth, that sense of the world, where did that come from? And that puts us in that historical train that leads through, 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 through Leonardo, who just basically took it and sort of gave it to the rest of the world. I mean, he, he polished it up a little bit and looked at it, but it certainly wasn't his. Through to Galileo, who simply said, well, we'll take this stuff, simply in quotes, take this stuff and hang it on the world. So from the perspective of where I was trying to get to in terms of the outcome, they seem to me the three pivotal ones. But choices of what were pivotal moments are always tricky to pull off. No, I can agree yeah. uh, if you replace the world with the Europe. But the thing is, the carpenters were all over the oh, world. Oh, okay. You know, all kinds of... Like, like interest, uh, collecting interest, and those kind of calculations were, were throughout the world, yeah. even, even before that. So that, that Fibonacci yeah, to yeah. Galileo, that contribution, I didn't... Uh, I am certainly open to the accusation that that's Eurocentric, maybe unduly so. I don't think it's unduly so, given my perspective, but I, it's a fair criticism that I'm taking a particular slant to get to a particular place. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So um, first I want to share with you uh, an actuarial statistic that I heard on the radio this morning that I, I found sobering. Um, if McCain is elected president, actuarially the odds that Palin will serve as president for some period of time are between one in six and one in seven. Um, That's fascinating. It's frighteningly like, low, isn't it? <laughs> the, 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 the odds that you were born on a Wednesday, basically. Yeah. But um, the question is, so you, you pointed out correctly that the, math, the actual mathematics that the calculus of probability is fairly simple, and yet ordinary people find it frightfully difficult to you understand, bet, yeah. and numeracy is even greater in this field than others. And I'll give you two examples that I like. One is 
Uh, Jim Morrison, no, no less a man than Jim Morrison, lead singer of The Doors, says five to one baby, one in five, when of course it's one in six, right? So, stats, not the same thing. Yeah. No, it's the probability of, of death in... It's not equated those two. I, I don't know about that. I, I think you're just a, a Doors freak. But <laughs> forget about that one. You know, I mean, more important is that, you know, my mother and, and lots of other smart people who aren't mathematicians just do not grok the fact that coins don't have memory. If you yeah. know what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. That, that you, you, after having flipped ten in a row, you're, you're still you're equally sure. likely, yeah. you know, to flip a head and a tail. So why is that? Why is it so hard for the man in the street to to grok the the basics of probability theory? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, it's to do. It's great. It must be to do with just the level of the abstraction of the thought and the idea. It, you know, probability is a weird thing because when you try to nail it down, it disappears. It really disappears. You say. I mean, the probability you assign to a single roll of a dice, you're assigning it to a single event, but it only manifests itself if you do it a hundred times and then only in the long run. So it's a very weird notion. Um, there's, there's a f I've written about probability theory many times and I, I sometimes talk about it on the radio. There's a guy, I talk about him in the book, who regularly writes me and basically complains about the fact that people cannot calculate probabilities. And I guarantee, uh, and, and rely upon him, but I guarantee he makes many decisions based upon numerical assessments of the future, because we all do. Um, but it's, a, it's weird stuff. Uh, I allude towards the end of the book to some work by Bruno de Finetti, an Italian mathematician who tried to make sense of subjective probabilities, which are notorious, even more problematic. Um, and, you know, an even greater problem is when people learn Bayesian statistics which is a very, very different kettle of goods and, and it's very different. The, by the way, the problem that I mentioned is DNA identification. Uh, there is currently no consensus on how you calculate for a DNA identification the probability that it's, a random, that it's just a random coincidence of identification and that it's not, a, it's not an identification. So the issue is you've got two DNA profiles and they match. Can you con what's the probability that you, you can assess the reliability to saying that because the profiles match, they come from the same source? or they're just two different people who happen to have the same profiles. Uh, not only is there not consensus, but the two opposing fields that, say, that, have, that have formed about how you calculate the odds make suggestions that are diametrically opposed. It's really scary. The, the, one of the issues is, if it's a cold hit case, when the size of the database goes up, does the hit, the identification, get more reliable or less reliable? One group of statisticians argues fervently that it gets less reliable. The other one says it gets more reliable. And I've done, I've done with those, those arguments what Pascal and Fermat were doing with theirs. I've looked at both arguments. With Pascal and Fermat, you can see which one's right and what goes wrong. Both of those guys have convincing arguments. <laughs> <laughs> they both look right, and yet they cannot possibly be both right, which must mean... Um, on the basis, of, and I'm not the only one that's looked at it, lots of people looked at it, if a lot of people who have some understanding and some numerical abilities can look at these things and see the logical soundness of both arguments and agree with both and yet recognise that they're at odds, then this, we're clearly missing something in our conception of how to calculate the odds. So, um, you know, that's a very extreme little case that's current, but it is the case that, yeah, people have enormous difficulty with probabilities. Uh, I've written about this elsewhere, I've thought about it a lot. I, I, I I think it's something to do with, what, with the kind of problems we evolved to solve. You know, we are not precise problem solvers. We are used, to, I mean, we live on our wits, essentially. We are, you, we, what we are very good at doing is coming to rapid conclusions based on minimal information. We have stereotypes, we have all kinds of things that go on with us, and that's the way we live our lives. And we know that a reliable strategy for living is that Roughly what's going on in our immediate environment and what's been happening in our immediate environment is all we need to know to base an answer for tomorrow. We get into trouble when we try to argue hypothetically about the odds in the future on the rest of the world. So I think it's something to do with the fact that we can naturally do mathematics when it's mathematics in a real context. But by their very nature, these probabilistic arguments have taken us out of a context into some hypothetical future context. And I think that's something to do with why we find it difficult. Because it's not that we can't do the mathematics, it's, it's usually simple mathematics. It's what mathematics should we be doing? And people can argue fervently about that one, yeah. Thanks, Kit, for the lecture. Uh, uh, I guess uh, my statement may not be mathematically accurate, uh, but in common terms, uh, when we throw a coin uh, once, we can say that uh, the probability of getting ahead is 
and that of getting a tail is 50%. Uh, however, uh, if we can apply uh, the laws of physics or calculus on a particular event, we can kind of determine the outcome of the event. So is it fair to say that uh, probability theory is kind of an approximation where we are unable to kind of apply the laws of physics or calculus to determine yeah. the and outcome? And in fact, if you apply the laws of physics, it's 51% in one direction, 49% in the other. That was a calculation Percy Diaconis did at Stanford about four or five years ago. He actually looks at the, it, it, he looks at the equations uh, of what happens when you flip a coin. And then when he did that, he actually had, a, had built a coin flipping machine that was built very precisely in the Stanford Engineering Department to flip coins with exactly the same flipping force. And by golly, 51% of the time, it lands the same way up as it starts. It's an inertia issue. There's enough inertia that there's a slight preference that it will finish up in the same orientation as it begins. It's 51% of the time. If you start with the coin always heads up and you flip it, 51% of the time it will end up heads, 49% it will end up tails. And that's what you get by looking at the physics. So indeed, the argument by symmetry that says it's 50% is an approximation. It's not that good an approximation. It's 51 to 49 as opposed to 50-50. But you're right, you can make these calculations based on the physics. And you get, in this case, you get a much more accurate answer. Uh, it's, but it's cool stuff. It's worth looking up that. that, that the, the last time I looked, you could get, there was a YouTube video available of the machine flipping coins. Uh, although Percy Diaconis can actually flip a coin and make it come whichever way you want it. <laughs> He's not just a great mathematician. I don't know if you've ever had him here to give a talk. If you haven't, you're sure as anything should do. I mean, and he'd come and talk, but, but he will demonstrate. He'll say, what do any want it? And he'll flip it, because he was a kid who um, ran away from home when he was young to join the traveling circus, became a magician and a conjurer and a card sharp, and then eventually got a PhD from Harvard and became a professor at Harvard and now a, a named professor at Stanford. He's one of these guys that can do anything in the world he wants to. Um, but he did this study of, of, of toy costing. And you're right, that with, with all of these physical randomizers, you can actually study them as physical problems and calculate the outcomes. So in that case, is it fair to say that uh, like probability theory applies to more of social events where it is very difficult to kind of determine the outcome? Yeah, yeah, but, so, but on the physical yeah. side, it's uh, probably we can use calculus or... Yeah, on the physical side, you can most, yeah, you can pretty well, you know, they're mechanical systems, unless the complexity is sufficiently great that, that, you, that there's a kind of computational issue, you can, you can do it in terms of the physics, if they're physical, physical systems, yeah. Uh, on the social side, um, who knows? I mean, ultimately, how science will go. I mean, if we all ultimately come down to neuronal circuits and things, I mean, you know, who knows what kind of sciences we'll have. Um, what I find interesting is the degree to which you can use probability theory to predict how people will behave. Well, we know you can do it for populations, pretty reliably. Um, it's remarkable how accurately you can be applying probability theory to individual people. Uh, one of the first successes was in serial killers. My previous book on, number, on, on, on the TV series numbers, uh, it's possible to predict the behavior of serial killers because they behave in a predictable way, but they're individual people. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Keith. My pleasure. Thank you.